to begin with. My name is Chief Naftali Ben Naftali Ben Yisrael. And I must give all glory to God, the great King of the universe. He's our creator, maker, owner, and possessor. Without acknowledging my maker, I cannot begin to even speak about my life. I owe everything to the great king of all the worlds. My life, my wife, our love for one another, our home that we share, our children, everything comes from the Almighty. And it was not always so with me that I could acknowledge that there is a higher power, that there is a first cause to everything in creation. Well, I'm going to go back a bit now because this is very important. I was born June 30th, 1942, right here in Brooklyn, New York, in old St. Mary's Hospital, Buffalo Avenue, near Prospect Place. My mother said it was about uh, 5.30 in the evening. My grandmother said it was 5.30 in the morning. My mother said I was there. So I take her word for it. I remember the time. I actually remember being laid on a metal scale and it was so cold I screamed. And then I saw water in my eyes. I didn't know they were eyes. I, I could see water and I could hear crying and moving across a room and I was laid on my mother's bosom and I closed my eyes. When I opened my eyes again, I was three years old. It's as though all of that went blank from that moment until 1945. I was three years old on Madison Street in Brooklyn and I knew where I was. All right, so we'll go from there to elementary school. I went to school like all little boys and I began to find out that I was colored. I was um, a so-called Negro. I hadn't heard that other word yet, but I had this complex about I was less than other people. Uh, it wasn't so very strong in me at that moment, but I knew that I was different, especially when we moved again and I went to an all-white school. Everyone there, or most of the people there, had never seen anybody that looked like me. It was in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. And when I got there, I really realized I was different because they began to let me know you have two strikes against you because you're colored. I didn't like my hair. I didn't like my skin color. I wanted to be like the people in the movies. <laughs> movies. My mother started taking me to the movies during the Second World War. My, my father was away in the Navy. And everybody on the screen was white. I wanted to be like them. And when I got into a white school, I really felt inferior. And the word nigger was a terror. Even to be called black sent fear and dread all through my body. I was afraid a lot of the time. But then I found out that the white people in my age group were afraid of me. It was a very strange phenomenon. <laughs> so there I was, went to a junior high school and got up in there and the people there found out that I was from the projects 
and the projects had the gangs and the white boys used to come down to the projects to hang out with the colored guys because that made them feel tough all right <laughs> So when I went back to school the following term into the eighth grade, I was a big shot. But I still had this inferiority. I had this feeling of the word minority actually meant you were less than human. Um, not quite as good as other human beings. It was sort of ingrained in me. I'm speaking about this because I never really came out of it until I heard about the Holy Scriptures. Um, after junior high school, I went to high school. I didn't do well in high school because I didn't like geometry. Until that time, I passed everything. I was just plain uh, fast. I didn't read a lot. I just looked at a thing and I had it. I passed the test. I was gone. I felt uh, good about that because I didn't like doing homework. I did everything with the shortcut. <laughs> I left out a little something. My father and mother separated um, when I was young. And when I got to be about 13 years old, I got into trouble with the police. And uh, they went and found my father. They made him reach out to me. Chief, um, mm -hmm. what, what were your, your, your parents' names? Um, well, I was born to two beautiful people. <laughs> my mother's name was Violet Gwendolyn Jilks. She was from Barbados. She was actually conceived in Barbados and born in Brooklyn Hospital. They left uh, Barbados in 1920, just about the time my grandma was going to deliver her. And she was born here. My father was Ernest Foles, F-O-L-E-S. He was born in Cairo, Georgia. They fell in love and got married, and uh, the way they tell me is uh, he started getting sick on the stomach. And uh, they took him to the doctor. And the doctor said, there's nothing wrong with you. Let's check your wife. And she was pregnant. That was me. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, they had sympathy pains. He suffered all the way through the pregnancy. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> and, well, I didn't know him too well until I was 13. I mean, as a little boy, he used to talk to me at my bedside before I fell asleep. And then, when I got in trouble with the police, he got me and my brother to come to spend the weekend with him. And after he knocked me on my butt, he took me into his room and showed me a bookcase. He said, get a book and read it. And that was the first time I ever read a whole book. Wow. You know, I was 13, you know. I, I was skating by for a long time. I read a book called The Hoods by Harry Gray. It was about New York City gangsters of the Jewish persuasion. Um, uh, they made a film about it many years later called Once Upon a Time in America. That was from that book. Okay. And the very next book I read was the life of Billy the Kid. You could see I stuck with the criminals. <laughs> the criminal element. <laughs> it fascinated me. And so from 13 years of age until I was about 26, I read everything I could get my hands on. Right. I read Tolstoy, Shakespeare, Dostoevsky, Cervantes. I read almost everything that they wrote. When I read Tolstoy, I read The War and Peace while going back and forth to work and on the job. Um, what I'm saying is... Well-rounded. <clears throat> mm -hmm, because I dropped out of school when I didn't like 
geometry at 16 and enlisted in the Marine Corps but um, they caught me and uh, <laughs> made me wait until I was 17 to go in. In the 1940s when I was a youngster um, and the, uh, the end of the 1940s or throughout the, the decade of the 40s from 42 on there was no television. Uh, television was invented or introduced in 1939 World's Fair but it never came into the black neighborhoods. Nobody ever had a television until the 1950s so my instrument or my uh, introduction to using my imagination was radio and I listened to the radio and I could see in my mind's eye the story being told like if we were listening to the Lone Ranger or Superman or the Red Rider or Gangbusters or Gunsmoke and Dragnet all of those things were on radio before television I could see these plays in my mind and so fast forward again when I got to the book I mean uh, that first book The Hoods by Harry Gray I could smell it I could smell the Lower East Side I could see all of the characters I, I began to be able to visualize nearly anything when I went into the Marine Corps and that was the hardest thing boot camp was a beast I mean they took away everything from you all of your clothes you had to mail that home the first day and then they took away your self-respect your identity everything just tore it away made you into nothing a nobody like a worm and then they built you back up with their indoctrination they made right. you into a killing machine you right. wanted to be able to serve this country and this flag and oh boy so to escape the drudgery and the pain of the training and everything I would just visualize other things or else I would just go into a zone of course this is all leading to something but right. when I was uh, in the Marine Corps I stayed two years I enlisted for four years but um, peacetime Marine Corps was a real drag when you get out of you know, <laughs> you know out of war, right? yeah we wanted to kill somebody come on you right. know <laughs> I know how to do it now right. <laughs> you know what are we what's going on here the closest I came to it was Dr. Castro sent a message uh, to the President of the United States after he took over Cuba Cuba was in his control and the United States sort of double crossed him they wouldn't give him the aid and the backing that he needed so he went to Moscow and they gave him everything so he came back and said well I'm a communist now that's 90 miles from Florida and when they began in the uh, Pentagon to talk tough to him he said well I'll tell you what send a hundred thousand Marines down here and I'll send a hundred thousand Marines back dead well <laughs> you know that was like good news to us man because you going we got on to five minutes standby we got uh, that meant you never got undressed you lay down in your bunk with your weapon fully dressed packed and ready to go and one night they woke us up and bam into those six buys that's a two and a half ton troop carrying truck and took us across North Carolina from Camp Lejeune up to Moorhead City North Carolina and into ships and sailing to Cuba that's as close as I got to war by the time we got halfway there they turned us back and put us off in uh, Haiti Wow that's interesting so it was that close huh? It was close yeah it was during the time of the Bay of Pigs I got turned around because Kennedy sort of backed out